All right, we'll open your Bibles for tonight's lesson on the walk of faith. We're going to look at several scriptures together. Let's begin with Hebrews chapter 10, and then we'll go to Isaiah 26, as it's printed on your page there. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 to 23. Let's give our attention to the word of God. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these... There is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now turn over to Isaiah 26, verses 1 to 4. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Amen. Tonight we want to continue thinking about the walk of faith. I think what what we need to, to realize as we think about this study and as we continue this topic, what we need to realize is that that there is a difference, a large difference in fact, experientially, between knowing the faith and walking and living by the faith. And this, of course, if you've done any of the reading or just mindful of of the studies that we have worked through already, this is where Romain is addressing. He's addressing what does it mean, what does it look like to actually live by faith? And now we're looking at the daily walk, the daily experience, the conscientious blessings, the experiential blessings of what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a clear conscience. Nothing greater, more precious in life, (coughs) nothing worse, more terrifying than a guilty conscience. In fact, that is the terror of hell. The flames of hell more than anything else are the gnawing conscience So we come to a question tonight as we think about this, what if I believe the truth and what if I believe what God has said concerning Christ and the work of redemption for my own soul, but my conscience is still not at peace? Like I could affirm to you creedally that this is right and this is true, but my conscience is still not settled. What if I'm in that predicament? How do I move forward? And so the point of the lesson then tonight is to encourage us to actually rest in the truths of God concerning Christ's work for us and the Father's acceptance of that work and therefore not only the credit to us of what Christ has done in terms of our sins being dealt with and washed away, but the Father's acceptance of us in return. That we, as we talked about, we actually have reconciliation. We're not just reconciled, and again, in a creedal sense, but we actually have and therefore can enjoy reconciliation. We can live in that peace. We can, we can walk in that peace. The, the tension, or more than tension, the enmity is in fact gone. So we can actually not only live but even thrive in the peace that we have with God. So how do we do that? There's a couple of ways as we think about why our conscience is still troubling us. Probably one of two reasons. First of all, it stems from either unbelief, We just simply are failing to believe what God has said or a weak, faltering faith, an unsteady faith, okay? So these then are the two categories that are before us tonight. 
So turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll look at just a few more verses to lead into the first consideration, O you of little faith, calling us out for our unbelief. Do you not believe, Christ has said to his disciples repeatedly. Are your hearts still so hard, Christ rebuked his disciples. O you of little faith, he told them repeatedly in the Gospels, as you know. Mark chapter six, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, we find these words. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Christ is pressing upon us the reality, obviously in the context here, not being anxious or worrying about what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear, what about tomorrow. And Christ is speaking to us, Tenderly and yet, and, and yet with this sort of admonition. Look at how Christ, look at how the Father takes care of all things. Takes care of the grass, the lilies, takes care of the birds, the sparrows. How much more will he take care of you? Why do you have such little faith on this matter? There's, in other words, there's overwhelming testimony in your very hands, before your very eyes, in creation. There's overwhelming testimony that should settle and remove all unbelief. You have no reason to be unbelieving. Turn over to chapter 8, verse 26. When Jesus calms the storm, he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Of course, you remember Christ is asleep in the boat. They're worried. Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Well, you can't perish because I'm with you. Your faith is so small. You're not factoring, you're not taking into account my presence, my power, my authority, just who I am as your Lord, as God, the Son of God. And then again in Matthew 16, verse 8, speaking here, when he warns them of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they're like, oh, well, it's because we brought no bread that he's talking about, the leaven. Verse 8, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Are the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I'm not talking about bread? I'm talking about something else. O oh, you of little faith. So what if we have a sense of guilt that's still bothering us? Again, we believe the truth. We believe what the scripture says. At least we think we do. But guilt is still bothering us. Well, guilt comes from the broken law. Right? When we sin and transgress against the law of God, guilt comes as, as the, the daughter of sin, if you will. It always follows. And it comes from the apprehension of the punishment we deserve. We know we've done wrong, and we know we deserve to be punished, Romans 1.32. So guilt immediately sets in. But when we go to the Scriptures, what do we read? We read that Christ restored the law to its dignity, that Christ delighted in the law, that Christ joyfully submitted to the law on earth, and that Christ made the law of God infinitely honorable by obeying it perfectly. Christ's obedience to the law of God shows the law of God to be Holy, just, and good, as Paul says. And Christ did that for all those who put their faith in him. So how can we believe that Christ has satisfied the law of God for us and still be under a sense of guilt? Right? Basically, what, we're at, what Romaine is asking here is if we believe that Christ's satisfaction, Christ's obedience of the law has been credited to us, that Christ's perfect obedience has been imputed to us, if we believe that, then why do we still feel that we have to offer the law a perfect obedience? Right? Why are we trying to offer a perfect obedience to the law of God, knowing that we never can, if Christ has already done it? The punishment for our sins was laid on Christ. Christ suffered all that was due to us for our transgressions. He was our atoning sacrifice. How can we believe that Christ atoned for our sins and yet fear that God's justice will still punish us. Did Christ atone or did he not? If Christ did atone for our sins and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then why are we fearing condemnation? 
Why are we walking around and conducting and carrying ourselves before the presence of our Father in heaven as if condemnation still hangs over our head? As if any moment God could still destroy us, cast us off into hell. Why are these fears troubling us? Why is guilt troubling us? Are we looking to Christ or are we not? Romain gives a couple of really simple examples. He says a debtor wouldn't fear being arrested if his surety paid the sum and he had the receipt of it in his hand. Whatever the debtor owed, if someone else paid it, and the debtor was given the receipt that said paid in full from the magistrate with his own stamp, if you will, why would he ever fear being arrested? Would he walk around fearing that the, at, at every siren they're coming for me? Of course not. He holds the receipt of his clearance. He would never be afraid of the sirens. He would not fear at all. A felon with a pardon in his hand would greatly dishonor its signatory if he lived in constant dread of being arrested and suffering for his crime. He's been pardoned. Why would a felon walk around expecting at any moment to be arrested, at any moment to be punished for the crime for which he's received from the judge a full pardon? Did the judge pardon him or did he not? Well, he did. I have the receipt here. I have the record here. I have the court order here. Then why is he afraid? He dishonors the judge's signature. Well, think of what great signatory has signed our receipt. It's signed in the blood of Christ. What great dishonor do we do to the blood of God himself if we carry ourselves as if we're still being threatened with judgment? And so he says, number three, likewise, if you've confessed your sins to God and you trust in Christ's atoning work, yet still walk in the guilt of sin and fear of punishment, it can only be one of two reasons. Either you don't believe in the person and work of Christ for believing sinners, or you don't believe the record of it in Scripture. Right? In other words, we're, we're falling short somewhere because either Christ did it or he didn't do it. Well, the Scripture says he did it. Well, then either Christ did it for you or he didn't do it for you. Well, the Scripture says he did it for you if you believe. So where is the holdup? Where's the struggle? This is what we're getting at. We read those great famous words, and they ought to be famous. They indeed are in Isaiah 53. Verse 4. The prophet says, Surely he has borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We in our unbelief, we in our ignorance and foolishness thought maybe he had done something wrong. Why is God afflicting him? Surely, like Job's friends, right? You must have been a really bad person to be treated like this. What have you done wrong? And what does the prophet say? He did nothing wrong. He was punished for your wrong. He was cursed for what you did. He was an atoning sacrifice for you. Did Christ do this for his people or did he not? And what does the record of God say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. That's the record. That's what the scripture says. Is it the word of God or is it not? So consider then when we doubt we're doubting God's forgiveness. We're doubting Christ's work. We're doubting the atoning sacrifice. We're doubting the full righteousness. Consider these questions. Has Jesus made full atonement for sin? Has he brought in an everlasting righteousness? Well, what does the scripture say? You know, the passage from Romans 3, Paul's words are very firm. Romans 3, verses 23 to 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, 
because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show the righteousness, his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what does Paul say? This is what God has done. This is why Christ was set forth by the Father. To show himself to be just. That he does deal with sin. Because in the Old Testament, for all appearances sake, God overlooked a lot of sin. A lot of the sin of his people. Not treating them as they deserved. Showing mercy upon mercy upon mercy upon mercy. We would have long thrown out the Israelites and given up on them. How can God forgive them again? How can he bring them back again? How can he send another prophet? How can he have more grace? What's happening with all this sin? No payment is being made. Somebody's got to pay for all these transgressions of God's people. All this mercy, all this grace. Where's the catch? Christ was coming. And when he came, God showed himself to have been just. All the while, forgiving his people because the offering of Christ was to be offered. And he, of course, also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Has Jesus made full atonement for sin? Has he brought in an everlasting righteousness? Yes, says Paul. And in fact, as Hebrews 5 says, no man takes this office unto himself. So Christ did not presume to take up the office of redeemer or mediator. God says, I have found help in one who is mighty. Right? That upon his shoulders the government has been, has been placed. God says, I have raised up my son. I have set up my king on my holy hill. The father appointed him. The father chose him. The father ordained him. Certainly then the father must be pleased with him. In other words, the father is the one who set all this in motion. So where is there need or cause to question the validity of what Christ has done if he didn't do any of it on his own account. As he said, the words I speak are not mine but the Father's. The things I do are not mine but the Father's. I'm here to fulfill his will. It's his desire to redeem you, and therefore he has sent me. And therefore the second thing is that, that very fact. Has the Father demonstrated again and again his perfect delight in his person and in his infinite satisfaction with his work? What did the Father say repeatedly? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In Acts 2, we read that the father made him, this Jesus whom you crucified, let it be known unto you, says Peter, that, the, that God made him both Lord and Christ. How unquestionably then is the Father absolutely satisfied with the work of the Son if upon the work of the Son, God the Father raised him up and set him on the highest throne above all creation, gave him the name above every name so that every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth, all mankind and all angels would bow, confess him to be Lord. The Father surely must be pleased if he gave him the crown anointed him with the Holy Spirit beyond measure, gave him the church, put the earth as a footstool under his feet in every way. Is the Father pleased? Of course he is. He is pleased in every way. And so the chapter 5 of Acts says that Christ was raised up as both leader and captain of our salvation in order that forgiveness and repentance might be preached in his name. So the Father raised him up in order that the good news of salvation for sinners might be preached in his name. Just as Christ came to exalt the Father, the Father now is heralding the Son. Jesus says, ask whatever you want in my name, and the Father will do it. And so we, we crown our prayers in Jesus' name. Not in the Father's name or the Spirit's name, although God is one. But there's a reason the focus has been placed upon the Son by the Father. God would have you look at none but His Son. Because none is more precious, none is more beautiful, and there is no other Redeemer or Mediator. God is so pleased with Him that He wants you to be pleased with Him. So this is what the Word of God says. Can God's Word be broken? Can His promise fail? 
Absolutely not. Numbers 23, 19, the Lord is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it and will he not do it? God cannot speak and not do. If God ever speaks, it's because he's determined to do. Because God's speaking is his doing. Let there be light. And there was light. You are my son. With you I am well pleased. Lazarus, come forth. Peace, be still. The Lord bless you and keep you. God's words is God's deeds. That's why the Father and his word can never be broken. And what does the Father say? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel chapter 2. What does the Son say? Whoever comes to me shall be saved, and I will never cast him out. John 6, 37. And what does the Spirit say? Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Revelation 22, 17. Whoever, 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 every single one, let any man. This is what the Trinity says. And are these sayings not true? Is he who makes them untrustworthy? Is God untrustworthy? Is God unfaithful? Has God ever broken a promise? Has God ever failed to keep his word? Has the Lord ever said it and not done it? Never. 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 In fact, when the Lord would strengthen our faith, having given us his word, his promise, even to Abraham and then to all those who are in Abraham, all believing. When God gave his word, nothing more is needed. He knows that. But because of our weak faith, what does he do? Hebrews 6 says he adds to the word an oath, a promise. He swears. Well, we can swear by a lot of things to try to give strength to our promise. There's no one greater than God. So Hebrews 6 says he swears by his own name. As I live, says the Lord, this is my name, the Lord. And upon this ground, I will do it. And even as he brings his people back in Ezekiel 36, speaks of changing their hearts and bringing them back to the land. What does he say? I will not do this for your name's sake, but for my name's sake. My name I have put on the line. This was the whole purpose, of course, the whole significance of God walking between the pieces of the cut animals with Abraham and when the covenant was made and ratified in Genesis 15. God took full responsibility for the covenant of grace. He'll do his part. He'll do your part. This is how faithful God is. This is how trustworthy he is. This is how dependable he is. If any doubts remain about the work of Christ for all who believe and the pleasure of God with regard to the, that, the work of Christ, if any doubts remain, nothing can relieve them but to continue to read and hear the word of God, which is no lie, and repeatedly entrust your whole self to the word of God. Nothing settles, nothing can settle our faith but the word of God. Because the word of man just can't cut it. Right? Man makes a promise to us and we say, well, how do you know? How can you, how can you convince me? How can you assure me of that? How do you know you're right? How do I know you're right? I mean, you really, really believe that, but that, what does that do for me? The word of man is only so much, isn't it? We know the word of men is not good. But the Lord can be trusted. Psalm 22, 5, To you our fathers cried and they were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Nobody who has ever trusted God has been put to shame. Not a single person in all the millennia of the church's history to back to Adam. This is why the Lord has given us his gospel, not simply in an oral fashion, but in a written fashion. This is why we have a written revelation, that the one who runs may read it. 
whoever, wherever, from whatever strait, in whatever fix you find yourself, here is the promise of God. Nothing can, can stand up against it. It corrects all things and all persons. As Paul said, let all the world, let God be true and every man a liar. In the end, our faith is built upon not the word of men or man, but the word of God alone. So when our faith is small and we're, we're beset by doubts and we're beset by unbelief, we have gone wrong somewhere in the earlier stages of putting our faith where it ought not to be. Trusting, maybe an emotional frame. I believe it because I feel so good about it. Well, where are those, where, where's that faith going to be when those feelings go? Or I believe it because my parents are so sure of it. I believe it because my pastor is absolutely convinced of it. What about when those items change? Your faith can't be placed upon anything. This is why even our own confession says, upon what ground do we believe that this is the word of God? Upon the ground of the church's testimony? No, not at all. The church's testimony is an encouragement to your faith, but it can't be the ground of your faith. Because churches can err. So the ground of our faith is always in the word of God itself and never anywhere else. So I think a lot of times if we find ourselves in, in this sort of place of struggling, 99% of the time, somewhere along the line, we put our faith on something else. Our foundation has shifted. And we've either trusted, as the song says, in that sweet frame or we're trusting in a word of man. We're trusting in a particular providence. We're trusting in something external. We're trusting in something internal even, but something outside of the word of God. Isaiah 50 verse 10, Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the Lord his God. There's nothing else that can stay you in the storm. There's nothing else that can settle doubts and fears but the word of God. And that leads right to the second condition, this unsteady faith. We ask the question, how is the peace of God to be kept ruling in the conscience? The answer is the same way it was received at the first. Your peace with God came by faith, and your peace with God will be strengthened by faith. There's nothing new, right? The means by which we're converted is the means by which we're, we grow. It's ridiculous to think that, that, we, that the faith by which we come to God isn't, isn't uh, sufficient for growth. The gospel by which we're saved is the same gospel by which we grow. And so we continue to come back to the same place. Peace was made in our hearts at the first by casting ourselves upon Christ and believing that he shed his blood for us. Paul's words in Romans 5.1 are straight to the point. Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Placing faith in Christ, we receive justification, and flowing out of that, peace. Peace with the Father in heaven. Ephesians 1, 7 and 9 says that in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. These are settled facts. Settled facts. So when doubts return, we must return in faith to the same fountain and have the atoning blood applied again to the conscience, which is the, alone the thing that can cleanse our conscience from dead works. So we find what John says in 1 John chapter 1. As John here writes, to encourage our faith and to, to keep us from wavering. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Notice, faithful and just. And then chapter 2, I am writing, the, writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. He has made satisfaction. What is John doing? He's calling his readers to believe it. He's calling his readers to trust what God has said that Christ has done. 
and the evidence that God has given that what Christ did, the Father approved of. This was the whole point of Pentecost. When Peter said to all those who were listening, we're not drunk as you suppose. This is what has happened. This is what you're seeing and hearing. Jesus, the Jesus you crucified, God made him Lord in Christ. He he's, is seated in the heavens. He received the Spirit, anointing him as the Son of Man, exalted in the heavens, glorified with our body. And having received the Spirit as the head, it now pours out upon the church of the living God on earth for all ages. That's the greatest evidence. Pentecost is the greatest evidence of the efficacy of the work of Christ, but also the, ple the, the pleasing nature of it in the eyes of the Father. Pentecost is glorious. That's the Father saying, it's beautiful in my sight. I love what you've done. I accept it. Your bride is beautiful. Your bride has been adopted. Your bride is my child. My children. This is the unchangeable and unalterable testimony of God. That believing in Christ will always bring the same cleansing virtue and keep the conscience purged from the guilt of sin. Faith in Christ will always save. And faith in Christ will always sanctify the saved. It will save the lost and sanctify the saved. Faith in Christ will always wash, always cleanse, always strengthen. If guilt ever troubles our conscience, then it's only because unbelief has crept in, not because God has withdrawn his peace. De facto, God remains at peace with us because justification never changes and justification has secured an unalterable, unchangeable, eternal peace. Unbelief, when it creeps in, will have us question the blood of, whether the blood of Jesus <coughs> actually does cleanse from all sin and whether the scripture testimony about it is absolutely trustworthy. Guilt comes in by one of these two doors. Do you doubt the virtue of Christ's blood concerning your sin or the truth of God concerning his testimony regarding it? We know Jesus forgives us our sins. But what if it's the hundredth time you've committed it? Does the fountain still run for me? We know Jesus forgives sins and he'll save the chief of sinners. But what if you, who know better, who have so much light, so well trained, so well taught, absolutely no excuse, what if you fall grievously? Is there mercy for you? This is where unbelief trips in. This is where the devil brings his bellows and stirs these things up and stokes this fire in our minds, this fire of unbelief. Again, we can believe these things creedally, theologically, confessionally. But sometimes it's really, really hard to bring that home to the heart when we find ourselves in the pit. When we're under a heap of guilt and shame and fear and Satan comes to stir all of that up and to try to separate us farther and farther in our comforts and conscience from God's truth. What does the word say? Did Jesus die for all my sins or did he not? Is the tomb empty or is it not? Was the spirit poured out as evidence that he's seated in the heavens as a head of the church? Or was he not? Does the gospel yet go forth? Is it yet a day of salvation or is it not? Is today the day of faith or is it not? The devil would have you question all these things. And there's every evidence in the book to believe the truth of God. It is our privilege as God's people, as the believing, it is our privilege to be comforted by resorting daily to the royal charter of grace and the storehouse of divine promises. Jesus has made peace by the blood of his cross. And if we believe what the God of peace says, then that peace should always rule in our hearts. 
We should never let go of it. In other words, on God's part, with regard to the covenant he has made and the, and the blessings which Christ has secured unfailingly, unchangeably, the eternal blessings on God's part, all things are well-ordered and sure. All things regarding our peace are unalterably fixed and settled. So if there's any wavering going on, where is it? It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. We're the ones that's slipping and withdrawing. We're the ones backsliding. We're the ones that's allowed unbelief to creep in. God hasn't changed his disposition toward us. Now, we could talk about God's disciplining his children. We could talk about, as the psalmist would speak of it, God's anger toward his people's sins. That's a whole different matter. We deal with that in the Psalms and Job and so many other places. But what we're talking about here is my peace with God is settled in Christ and secured in the covenant. And when we're feeling God's withdrawal and we're feeling God's anger, if you will, then we've got to go back to the covenant, back to the cross, back to the tomb, back to Pentecost in order to have the peace restored. Because that never changes. Right? It's the difference, as we've talked about so many times before, the difference between union and communion. Union can't change. God has married us to his son and can never be broken. God hates divorce. He'll never divorce his bride. He betrothed us to him forever. And so union never changes, and that's where peace is established. But it's through communion that we continue to enjoy that peace. And our sins break the communion and the fellowship there. But, but the union is where our foundation rests. My faith rests upon the union, not on my feelings in communion. So communion and feelings and comforts are going to fluctuate, but union never does. It can't. For Christ to divorce his bride, he would have to lose his humanity. And the two natures have been unalterably, eternally joined in the one person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He can't ever put off that humanity. So if we're unsettled in our hearts, in our conscience, then what's the cause? Well, a couple of thoughts. Is it the fact that you still find sin dwelling and working within you? Or that you see how weak your faith and other graces are? Is that what unsettles your faith? Is that what disturbs your conscience? The fact that you still find sin within? Well, have you forgotten that Christ's blood cleansed you from the guilt of Adam's sin? And that Christ's faith and graces were strong for you? You're saved on Christ's righteousness, not your righteousness. Yes, you're a sinner by nature, but Christ died for that sin nature. That sin nature has been, you've been forgiven your original sin, not just your actual sins. You've been forgiven the fault of your own corruption. Secondly, is it because your peace ebbs and flows that you doubt its genuineness? If I was truly saved, I would never doubt if I was truly saved and truly at peace with God, then my peace would never waver. Well, it should humble you that your peace wavers. But it should not discourage you. Because God has taken charge of both you and your peace. And he keeps both by his almighty power. And that's what we forget sometimes, I think. We forget that it's God who keeps us. We think as though we keep God. And if I've lost him, then he's lost. If I can't feel him, if I've let go, then he's gone. Oh, beloved, it's not you who hold God. It's God who holds you. You're in his hands. Not he in yours. You're not the one holding on for life. He's the one who has yoked you to himself for life. And so we're told in the Philippians 4, Do not be anxious about anything, not even about your salvation or about your peace. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God has taken full responsibility for that. And he goes on. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence... 
If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What's going on in your head? What are you thinking? What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, the gospel, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So you've got the peace of God and the God of peace. The one guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the one whose presence is with you. You are as safe in God's hands at the lowest ebb as at the highest tide. In other words, your sense, and here's the key, your sense of your peace with God may vary. But God who is your peace never varies. Let this stay your mind on God. Let it keep your guilt out of your conscience even when you walk in darkness and have no light. Romaine has a wonderful section here that I've put in full quote. He says, search and examine yourself on this matter. Do you understand what's revealed concerning the way of peace? What was covenanted in the council of the eternal three? And what has been done in consequence of that council? Do you really understand? Let me remind you, he says, Jesus Christ is the great peacemaker. He has made peace through the blood of his cross. The Father sent him and gave him to be a covenant of peace for sinners, to fulfill for them all righteousness and to be their atoning sacrifice. The Father has seen the work which he gave him to do and has joyfully accepted it. He's perfectly satisfied with it and therefore is infinitely delighted with him and with all his people. He would now be known by the high style and title of the God of peace. Fury is not in him to those whom he sees in the beloved. I love that scripture. I can't think of the reference right now where God says, I have no wrath. I have no wrath toward my people. Remember Jeremiah 50 verse 20. Go to Israel, look for sins. You won't find any. I've washed them all away. There is no fury in him to those whom he sees in the beloved. He is a father, fully and forever reconciled to all his children in Jesus Christ. He loves them as he loves him. Go to John 17. The father loves us with the love with which he loves the son. He loves us as he loves the son. We are one with the father as the son is one with the father. We are one with the Son, as the Son is one with the Father. It's mind-boggling. It, only, it could only be if we are joined, as Paul says, with the same Holy Spirit who makes us one. More deep, more real, more spiritual, powerful, and enduring than any union among men. He loves them as he loves him with every kind of feeling of the most tender parent. And he will bring every one of them to partake with their glorified head of all the blessings of his everlasting love. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming back. That where I am, you may be also. If your mind is enlightened to understand or receive this truth, then why is it not effectual in your conscience? If you know this to be true, what the Son has done and the Father's approval of it and the Father's fixed and unalterable love toward all who trust in Jesus, that he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, if you really believe that, then why isn't that settling your conscience? Can you plead this truth before God on behalf of your own soul? Can you be as pleased as the Father is with what Christ has done for you? He raised him from the dead to show his pleasure. And can you not raise your faith from its doubts? If the peace of God rules in his heart toward you, then shouldn't it rule in your heart toward him? You see the question? Where's the trouble? 
Remember we've said before so many times, if Satan can't keep us out of heaven, he'll try to keep heaven out of us. And the meaning of which is that once we're united to Christ, we can never be separated. Once we're a child of God, we can never be divorced or outcast or orphaned. Once, the Satan, once Satan has lost us to the kingdom of light, we can never return to the kingdom of darkness. We have been united to Christ. Union is fixed. But what we're, walking, what we're talking about here in the life of faith and now in the walk of faith is walking in communion. And the devil will do everything he can because he can't unsettle, he can't disturb your union. He'll do everything he can to disturb your communion. And if faith is the chiefest grace by which every blessing comes to a child of God, you can't receive anything without faith. If faith is the, is the chiefest grace and the door through which every blessing comes, then all Satan needs to do is to unsettle your faith with unbelief, with doubt, with fear, with guilt. And he can stand in the way of a host of blessings, right? Because we stop praying. Because we don't think God receives us. God won't welcome us. I'm so dirty. I'm so guilty. I could, how can I go to the throne of grace? How can I go to my prayer closet today? How can I open the, how can I read? Every time I read, I'm so convicted. I can't read. How can I go to church and see all those faces, those people? I, I, I'm a hip, I feel like a hypocrite when I get around God's people. I can't. I, I, I won't go to church. All these things to keep you away from God, to keep you away from the means of grace, right? Because the means by which you got saved is the means by which you stay saved. The means by which faith was born in you is the means by which it is nurtured and cultivated in you. So where do you go? Back to the means of grace, back to the house of God, back to the scriptures, back to the prayer closet. Why? On what ground? Who do you think you are, O oh dirty man? Well, I know who I am, but I also know who God is. And by his grace, through the Lord Jesus Christ, he remains my father still. He remains my father still. I may have turned my back. I may have gone away and astray. But he never did. He remained true. Even though I was faithless, he remained faithful. Because as Paul says, he cannot deny himself. You see what I'm saying? Wherever you've gone, whatever you've done, whatever is going on, your father is in the exact same place you left him. Like the prodigal son, with arms open wide, ready to receive and welcome, but the ring on your finger again, the ring of sonship, the testimony for your sonship, the robe of righteousness, the new sandals on your feet, and a fattened calf for a feast. This is the Father's heart. It never changed. Once the love of God is fixed on his people, he never withdraws it. He can't. Because he never would have put it unless he was determined to actually see it through. And he knew what a mess we would make of our salvation. He knew what a mess we would make of our profession of faith. What a mess we would make of our Christian life. And he still saved us. He still came to us. He still started the ball of grace rolling in our lives. Because he was determined as the sole passer through the covenant. He was determined to see it to the end. To bring to completion the work he began. It's all of God. So that when the final stone of salvation is set, what will they say to it? Grace, grace, grace be to it. Nothing else can be said. This is our God. We have waited for him. This is our God and we rejoice in him. What a testimony. And this is the privilege we have. The peace, peace rules in the Father's heart. How do we know? Because Christ is on the right hand of the Father and the Spirit was poured out on the church and the gospel is being preached. It rules. Peace rules in his heart. It should rule in our hearts. And this is our privilege. And the greatest honor that we could put on the evidence of God being reconciled to us in Christ is to believe 
what he says and to make no appeal from it. Let our conscience speak God's words after him. Thus says the Lord. Our conscience needs to echo the scriptures. There's nothing else that we can echo that's worthwhile. Let our conscience plead our discharge from guilt under the seal of heaven and stop the mouth of our unbelief with those words written in golden letters in the royal charter of grace. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can you believe that verse? Can you believe where that verse comes in the scriptures? After Paul's most vulnerable moment, his heart opening moment, wretched man that I am, sinner that I am, failure that I am. See what Paul does? His lowest ebb is followed up by his highest praise. Not just verse 1, but all the way to verse 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. The greatest praise in Scripture is given after the lowest ebb of man's confession. Wretched man that I am. But this is the charter of grace. This is, what Paul, this is where Paul can go. This is where you can go. This is where I can go. Regardless of what we are in ourselves, despite what we are in ourselves. These are the words of immutable truth. These words cannot be broken. Never shall a child of God who is hidden in Christ, whose life is Christ, never shall, child, shall a child of God be condemned. Not one will be found in hell. Not one. So we need to honor those words by believing them. We need to trust in them and not be afraid. And the more faith we put in the testimony of God's word, the more peace they will pour into our souls until our conscience agrees with God and our conscience ceases striving. So whatever you see in yourself, whatever corruptions, failures, weaknesses, we need to run to God's word and rest again in Christ's work for us. Because this will make our trials work for us by settling us and bringing us near to God. You see, we tend to let our trials unsettle us. Our trials are meant to settle us because our trials are goads to drive us back to the cross, back to the gospel, back to our Father in heaven, back to the promises, back to the covenant of grace. When we don't let our trials lead us to the gospel, they lead us to some legalistic thinking by which we're then undone. God's friendship with us is eternally fixed. Our conscience needs to rest in that and walk in the peace of that eternal friendship. God has made himself our friend forever. Jesus said to us, sinners though we are, fruitless though we are, I call you my friends. Because I've revealed the heart of the Father to you. So set out daily with a humble boldness to walk with your God in peace. And to guide you in that way, keep to his word. Read the scriptures, pray over the scriptures, believe the scriptures. Take hold of the promises. Trust in the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from all sin. Enter boldly by the way open for sinners by his cross. Depend on Christ's intercession for you to keep you in step with the Spirit. Be entirely satisfied in your conscience with Christ as the way of salvation and the life of peace and seek no other help. Echo with Peter, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. I'm not going anywhere. That great example of hopeful, I determined that if I were to be cast into hell by the sovereign one, he must throw me from the foot of the cross into hell. I'm not leaving the gospel. I'm not leaving the word. I'm not, I'm not letting go of the promise that God made to sinners like me. That resolve is a very testimony and evidence of salvation. Romaine gives this as a closing prayer to this section. He says, let us learn then to pray this prayer. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, I beseech you to make practical to my heart 
what you have revealed in Scripture of the Father's love. Deliver me from guilt and condemnation by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Apply it effectually. Apply it continually. Help me to believe with more comfort in my conscience and with more steadfastness in my walk that His blood does indeed cleanse me from all my sins. O blessed Spirit, carry on your work in my soul. Lead me from faith to faith that I may at all times have the freedom to enter within the veil to a reconciled God and Father and may be able to maintain peace with Him against all doubts and fears, against all corruptions and enemies. Oh, teach me to draw near to Him with a true heart, steadfastly persuaded of His love and in the full assurance of faith in Jesus. This is your gracious office. Fulfill it in me that my heart may be sprinkled from an evil conscience and my body washed with pure water. Let me find grace sufficient for me, for Jesus' sake, to whom with you, O Father, and the eternal Spirit, three persons in one God, be equal honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a testimony. So, beloved, we have no reason to doubt our God who has given us his word and his promises and sworn them by an oath in his own name. We have no reason to question the work of Christ. Our Father has proven repeatedly his acceptance of it. Let our consciences tonight be settled in the fixed and eternal relationship that has been established by God with us. Not only that of friends with whom he is at peace, but that of a father counting us as sons. A bride never to be divorced from Christ, sons never to be orphaned from the father. An eternal relationship. He gave the blood of his own son to secure it forever and that we may never question it. That's why redemption was not worked out in heaven. And as Paul said, these things did not happen in a corner. That's why the redeeming work of Christ was so public and the word itself is written to give us a sure foundation for our hope. So I pray tonight you find great encouragement in the gospel and in what Christ has done and it will settle you whatever fears or doubts you may be dealing with.